now we're official. Welcome everybody. Uh, it is August 19th, 2021, and this is a meeting of the ETAC, Indigenous Eugene Technical Advisory Committee, for those of you who don't know the acronym by now. Um, just want to welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us on this gorgeous, as Heather mentioned, gorgeous summer evening. Uh, you guys are troopers for being here. Uh, just going to go through Zoom, Zoom protocol. Uh, I think you all have had enough Zoom meetings that you know. Um, if you have, if you would like to raise your hand, please go ahead and just do, use the raise hand and I'll call on you in the order that people are. Uh, have raised their hands. Um, I don't know what other rules we really have to follow. Maybe just try to keep the camera on and you're self muted when you're not talking. That's a, a big one. Um, has any everybody had the chance to review the um, agenda for today? And does anybody have any additions or questions or anything about that? It's pretty straightforward. I do not see any. Okay. So I will go to the next item, which is the approval of the June 17th, which is the last time we met, uh, Zoom meeting summary. And you should have all had a chance to see those. Um, I'll move to approve. All right, Ed. Second. And two seconds. Uh, any discussion? All right, I'll ask, I'll call for the vote. So all of those in favor of uh, approving the minutes from last meeting. Any opposed? Oh, sorry, I should have voted for myself. I'm in favor. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Okay, that was easy. Looks like we can move on. Next item is public comment. And Elena, if you could confirm, I don't see anybody attending. Um, Nobody is in our audience right. today. I don't see anybody attending and, uh, oh, okay. Yes, Ed, if you wouldn't mind just your microphone. And again, the other thing that I should mention is, um, I shouldn't say this now that we've been, actually someone used, used it, but uh, the chat function, because of public records, we aren't able to capture that. So let's try not to use the chat, but that was perfectly appropriate. So, um, okay. No public comments. So I think we are ready to jump right in. Um, we're gonna, today we're gonna re be reviewing the growth monitoring and building permits and Heather and Elena are gonna walk us through that. And then our last ag agenda item is, is going to be the report schedule and recap and just go through the schedule for the rest of this. So I will kick it over to Heather and Elena for the growth monitoring building permits. I'm gonna stick myself on mute. So take Thank it away. You. Thank you. Um, just make sure I'm not hitting the echo here. <clears throat> uh, before I jump into that, I did want to mention um, now that we are in the next fiscal year, what sometimes happens, um, which we've talked about before, is that people start trading hats about um, whether or not they're representing a commission, uh, a border of commission. So the three that we have as a requirement on the ETAC are planning commissioner, which is now Tiffany representing, um, now that John's not on the planning commission, city councilor, councilor Yay, And then um, Howard, you were representing sustainability commission. I have reached out to staff um, that support sustainability commission. I know they had a, a work session this week. Um, or I think it was a retreat actually. And so they were outlining um, uh, work plan items for the next fiscal year. And so this um, attendance, having someone assigned to this um, advisory committee was one of the things that was put on the agenda. So that hasn't been assigned yet, but it is in progress. So I just kind of wanted to let you know, all know, uh, update on that. Okay, and then I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, can folks see the presentation? 
Looks good. Okay, so this is always fun going having the presentation up on two different screens, one with my notes. So bear with me if I do something weird. Um, so uh, again, thank you guys for um, coming today. I hope that you enjoyed having um, July off. Um, we, I don't know if you remember, but we had talked about having multiple meetings in July and multiple meetings in August. And um, due to things that we'll talk about and go over at this meeting, um, and I think we sent an email letting you know kind of what was going on. So things a little bit out of our control, wanting to really make sure that before we bring data to you that it is um, been thoroughly vetted by staff. Um, so that's why we had some of those meetings canceled, and I'm sure you don't mind that. Um, so today we're going to be focusing on building permit review. Um, we're very excited to actually be having this conversation. We feel like that um, we've done so much work with our IT staff and with the community, um, the technical uh, resource group that was the previous incarnation of this group to try to really um, hammer out how we can collect building permit data better. And so we're, we're really excited to be able to talk about that today. We aren't gonna be able to bring as much information as we had hoped to, so we'll talk about that, but I think we have plenty um, for the agenda today. So um, this, is kind of an overview of what we're going to talk about. Just touch on the components graphic that we have on what we're focusing on today. And then Elena is going to um, walk through some of the key points from the memo that was in your packet. It was super lengthy and very technical. And I hope you all had an opportunity to at least skim it. Um, and we'll go over kind of the high points and then Elena is going to provide some specific examples so that you can see what we're talking about. Um, we'll have an opportunity for questions about all that because we wanna make sure that you all understand generally what we did. Um, you had to make a lot of assumptions and um, yeah, anyway, we'll get into that information. We wanna make sure you understand what we did and feel comfortable with the process we went through. Um, and then we'll go over um, the first set of results from um, that building permit review, which will be housing numbers, which is pretty exciting. Um, and we'll be talking about housing mix, which is also very exciting um, because I think that those are, uh, there's just so much conversation in the community about housing production right now and has been um, for the past couple of years. Um, then we'll have time for um, questions about those results, and then we'll go over next steps. So just a reminder on this um, very busy, now very busy graphic um, of where we're at. So the last time you saw this, the check marks that are in orange are the components of the monitoring system that we were still working on and um, hadn't brought results to you and charts yet. And so that's what we're doing today. We're focusing on the Eugene land use data that we're extracting from building permits. Um, we have the building permit system that is connected to this new database. Um, we have a system that links together building permits so that we can look at them all as one development site where that is the case like a large apartment complex um, that has multiple building permits. Um, we are linking this data to um, development incentives so that we're able to say how many dwellings, for instance, were built with something like um, MUPTI, the Multiple Unit Property Tax Exemption. And then we have the spatial component, which helps us um, be able to say, um, if the building permit is coming in, what kind of zoning it's happening on, what kind of, um, is it committed, protected, is it developed, undeveloped, or partially vacant in our buildable lands inventory, um, and also helps deal with if tax lots have changed over time from when we did the buildable lands inventory to when the building permit came in, so that we're capturing the actual impacts to the buildable lands inventory. So this is gonna be our focus today. 
So just to talk uh, before we dive into the details, um, just to step back a little bit and talk about what we can get a whole bunch of data, but what we've really tried to do is make sure that we're getting data that we're actually going to use and that we need. There's a whole bunch of data that we could get if we had more staff and time, um, but we really tried to focus on what do we need to answer the questions that we have identified. And so um, as we're going through our review process and we're pointing out certain things that we um, made sure we collected or decisions we had to make where we didn't review building permits because there were a lot of building, thousands of building permits, um, know that these are the questions we're trying to answer. So with housing development at a high level, are we meeting the need that we um, adopted, which is that we need 15,105 new dwellings by 2032? Um, is, are they coming in at the mix of housing types, what we call housing mix? Um, that we projected, which what we planned for was over 20 years, the new housing would come in at about 50% of it being single family and 45% of it being multifamily. Um, is the housing coming in at the density that we assumed? If it's coming in more dense, then it's using less land likely than we thought it would use. So we're probably developing our land not as quickly as we thought. If it's coming in less dense, it would be the other way where we'd be probably using more land than we thought we were going to use. So density is pretty important. And then housing developed with incentives. So we did a number of, we took a number of actions, we adopted programs, we changed the zoning code, things like that um, in order to be able to fit more housing inside our urban growth boundary than we would if we didn't do those programs. And so things like MUPTI, like I mentioned, um, we changed the plan designation of some properties to fit more housing inside the urban growth boundary, um, things like that. So are we seeing development related to those? Um, Kevin, I see your hand, but is it okay if I get through this slide? Okay, um, and then employment development is a little bit different. It's, it, oh, and I have a typo in there, sorry about that. Um, but for employment development, we are actually gathering new data with the building permit data um, that we hope will help us the next time we do UGB analysis. Um, so the mix of the types of um, new employment buildings that we're getting, what mix is industrial versus commercial, office versus retail, things like that. So kind of similar to housing mix. Um, we're collecting new data about how much additional employment building square footage we are adding because um, we hope we can actually use that. We had hoped we we would have liked to have had that the first time we did the UGB analysis. So we're trying to get that information now. Um, and then employment buildings. Um, well, there's two typos on this. I'm so sorry. Um, employment buildings developed, again, developed with incentives. And then finally, related to both of those is how quickly are we developing our land and how much is left? So really trying to um, understand how many acres of land was developed with these building permits. Um, and then looking at how much land we originally had in our buildable lands inventory supply and deducting those acres that were developed, how much land do we have left? Um, and is that more or less than we thought we would have at this point in the process? So those are the questions that were um, at a high level. And obviously there's a lot of sub questions under that. So I don't know if Kevin's the only one, but that's the hand I see. I was gonna say, if anybody has questions, Kevin, why don't you go ahead? Thanks. If you're gonna cover this, uh, as you go through the, the document, I kind of read through it and it wasn't real clear. Like in the housing, um, you'll, will you be able to extract the size of the unit 
and the number of bedrooms per unit. So we're, so we're dealing with people as well as just unit counts. Right. Yeah. Um, I would like to come back to that if that's all right. If we can kind of go through what we did do and then we can talk about those things um, that are in, kind of in addition. Because it's yes and no. So I want to, um, so hold that thought. Okay. I've got John followed by Ed. Thanks, Heather. Um, just a quick question um, on housing development with incentives. Are we just looking at the incentives that we identified as efficiency measures in the uh, UGB expansion, or are we looking at other incentives, things like CDD, CB, uh, CDBG uh, projects or uh, low-income in housing uh, property tax waivers, are those all lumped in there or is it just gonna be MUFTI and the uh, things that we did as far as efficiencies in the UGB expansions? Yeah, great question. We'll talk more about incentives next time, um, but I can say that mostly it's focused on the in incentives we adopted as part of the UGB analysis because um, that's how monitoring was generally set up, was what are all the things we need to monitor related to the UGB analysis. Um, but we have added some additional um, incentives with a recognition that a lot of times it's not just one incentive, but multiple incentives that, make, that help make the development feasible. Um, but we'll, we'll show you the charts that have the individual ones next time. And then one more question. And Tiffany, you may have to help me out with this one. I think there's new terminologies instead of single family and multifamily. What's the new, what's the new terminology and should we start using that in our documents? Oh gosh, what is it? It's not family. The, the is it household? Is it single household? No. Shoot. I gotta remember this. Um, we, are, we are changing the language of single yeah. family and multifamily yeah. in the code. Yep. And so, but that hasn't happened yet. And so, um, you know, a lot of these charts were already mocked up before, you know, based on the language that we were using in Envision Eugene. And so um, that's a really good point. I'm kind of holding off until we get to kind of the last moment and then we can make those word changes um, before we do the final report, but that's a really good point. Yeah, we definitely, we know that those are out there and we're just kind of waiting until it gets a, a little bit further down the line um, because every time we make these changes to charts, it means that there's another chart that isn't being updated or addressed. And we've got a lot of edits that we've asked um, our IT staff to do. Okay, yeah, I just, did, I didn't know if we wanted to do it now before before we got a bunch of stuff ingrained or if it's better to just go back at the end. And what what is the term? Help me with the term. Does anybody remember? I don't is it, remember. Isn't it, well, I, yeah, I'm not gonna say, cause I haven't, um, I know that we've looked at a couple of different options, but okay. I haven't seen the latest. All right, no problem. Thank you. Okay, Ed followed by Howard. Thank you. Uh, my question is close to John's first one. So when we're talking about housing development with incentives, wouldn't uh, Homes for Good and the St. Vinny projects uh, qualify in that category? They get SDC incentives and I believe permit fee incentives. Right. So at this point, we're not talking about incentives yet. We're just going to, today, we're just going to talk about the total number of dwelling units that we've seen. When we get to um, hopefully the next meeting, then we can dig into the incentive discussion. Um, but yeah, Homes for Good, those are all gonna be in there. Um, they're gonna be in these numbers. And then um, the projects that have dwelling, the dwelling units that got incentives will be a subset and we'll be able to kind of look at where those um, fell out. But yeah, we've got, low income housing property tax exemption. We've got, was it a land bank site that the city owned and then sold to, non, um, to a nonprofit to develop for low income housing? We have MUPTI, we have redesignation, we have accessory dwellings. 
We have, is it in the downtown plan boundary? Is it in an urban renewal area? Um, so we'll go all, all over all of that at the next meeting. Um, we just haven't been able to really vet that data yet. And so I don't wanna share it until um, we've gone through it as staff. Okay, um, Howard, do you still have a question? And then Michelle after Howard. Yeah, um, my question is not so much the uh, data per se, but uh, the use of the data. And uh, if, well, the databases and the way that uh, the data is structured, if there's a, a future city council that decides the housing mix needs to be changed, uh, will the, your, your uh, system, if you will, Will it be able to easily accommodate uh, those changes in policies, uh, especially the mix of single family, multifamily? What I'm particularly concerned about is what I'm seeing in my neighborhood where uh, single family houses are selling um, cash uh, and sometimes 10 to 15, 20% over asking price. It's just uh, astounding to me. And uh, I'm, I'm really concerned about affordability. And I know this is not necessarily going to go into permit data, but uh, it just uh, concerns me as to how sustainable this 55-45 uh, uh, housing mix can, uh, can continue given what's happening in the real estate market right now. Yeah, so you're hitting on some of the things that um, when we bring you the growth monitoring report, I think we, we kind of talked about like at this point, the charts that we've brought you, we haven't, we haven't been tying things together yet. And so I would say building permit data is absolutely related to um, housing affordability um, and, and what we're seeing in the community, whether it's the production or the type of housing being built, um, it's not the only thing, but it's one of the things. And so when we look at the growth monitoring report, we'll take some of those charts that we looked at earlier, which were housing cost data and housing affordability data and median income, all of those things, right? It's not just the cost of housing, it's also um, the incomes folks are making. Um, and then looking at housing production and trying to pull that together into the growth monitoring report because then what that can help council um, have more information that helps them make those policy decisions like, are we planning for the right housing mix? Um, and again, that's just what we're planning for. It's not necessarily what we've been seeing, um, even historically. Um, and so I'll talk about that, but, um, but yeah. So, so the system is being set up to, yes, um, you will see in the charts where we have an adopted assumption identified. Um, so the housing mix, the adopted um, housing mix that we projected for 20 years. And then um, whenever we adopt a new urban growth boundary analysis, that adopted assumption will change. And so the hope is that um, the data that we're putting together here will help inform those policy discussions. And we are setting up the system to be able to incorporate those kinds of changes, including changes like what um, John brought up, which is um, if we relabel all of our housing types or come up with different, uh, different housing mix categories or different housing types or you know whatever, um, our system is in has been developed to accommodate those kinds of things. Great, thank you. Changes. Yeah. Okay, I don't see any other hands up, Michelle. You you're good. Okay. Great. Right. So Elena is going to walk you through um, the methods um, and some of the key things that were identified in the memo um, and give you some specific examples and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions after each example because you know because yeah I think you're gonna have you might have questions um but first I just want to give a huge shout out to Elena and Zoli who is not who are not oh Zoli's not here Elena is here um they slogged through literally thousands of permits um, in the summer, which is really exciting. Um, and 
you know, have been looking at their computer screen, trying to understand this, dealing with a software system that was in test while we were entering data into it. And then, then it was published and we were still entering data and we had to fix bugs and not lose data. And I can't, I, I just can't thank them enough for their patience um, and their attention to detail. So um, just have to really give that shout out before Elena starts walking through um, all of this. Looks like Phil. Phil oh, was yeah, I was gonna say Phil. Did Michelle have her hand up earlier? She did, but she said, she, I think our question got answered. So she was good. I'm good, thank you, Phil. All right, so next slide, Heather. So I'm gonna talk about LandTrack which is the name of the software system that we are using to house the land use data from permits. So the way things have been, planners don't have a program where they have been able to document their permit review. There's been no spatial connection between building permits and the BLI or zoning or other databases, maps, and boundaries. And there's been nowhere to look at a development site that has multiple permits um, sort of together in one place. So moving forward, the planners will be entering information into land track when they review permits, including tax lot data, density calculations, use, employment square footage, and then parking, landscaping, and open space requirements. So not all of that information is being monitored as part of growth monitoring, but it will help the planners do their review more efficiently um, and sort of have that information all in one place as things change at a, in a, on a property over time. Um, and yeah, so we wanted to be able to collect all of the data on an entire development site in order um, specifically to get uh, um, accurate data for housing density. So for example, apartment buildings over multiple tax lots um, and just seeing, seeing everything together in one place. So next slide. So we have been doing uh, what we've called backfill permit review. So we've been backfilling all of the historical permit data into the new system and reviewing that for accuracy. So we reviewed permits back to 2012, the beginning of the monitoring period. And this included reviewing data that's auto-filled into the system based on generalized scripts that we put together, um, entering data that for whatever reason couldn't be auto-filled, so it wasn't previously generated or kept in a database and then sort of testing the software along the way, which is why we have little bugs, little bugs in the corner there. <laughs> um, and so we um, singled out many permits for manual review, um, just kind of based on different criteria and characteristics. Um, so building some examples of building permits that did warrant for the review were all development sites when there was multiple permits on a, on a site. Um, tax lots that were greater than half an acre. Um, and then these are just a few examples, but uh, lots that had existing dwellings as well as proposed dwellings, um, all accessory dwelling units. So based on that scope of work um, and then all permits that had used incentive programs, um, things like that. So just little, those flags uh, that sort of warranted our manual review and couldn't just rely on the autofill information there. So we manually reviewed um, confirming the tax lots associated with the permit, confirming the new use and that the development was associated with the correct tax slots on the permit. Um, in looking at residential permits, we confirmed any existing dwellings, removed dwellings, and new dwellings, and then we reviewed for potential student housing. Um, for monitoring specific items, uh, we looked at incentives, density, and BLI net density. So the difference there, um, the net density of the lot minus any protected and committed acres. Um, and that was a specific calculation that we used during the UGB analysis. Um, 
and then looked at new net new employment square footage, impact to the BLI, and then making sure that the allocated dwellings and new square footage um, and BLI impact were associated uh, with the correct lot. So sometimes there are multiple tax lots or a split plan designated lot or a split zoned lot and making sure we're allocating those dwellings and employments per footage to eat to the correct piece of the development site or of the site. And so I'm just gonna go through a couple of examples. I'm gonna start with single family dwelling permits, which will give a super straightforward example. Um, so we didn't review single family dwellings on vacant lots less than half an acre unless they were otherwise flagged. So if they were split zoned or something like that. Um, but otherwise we assumed that the entire lot was developed and full BLI impact acres. So that was the auto population for lot, vacant lots less than half an acre. Um, so what we did review some um, one permits that were flagged for special conditions, single family dwellings on lots greater than half an acre. We reviewed all manufactured home permits and all accessory dwelling unit permits. And then um, we reviewed other things like net new dwellings. So if it was a replacement dwelling, um, making sure that that was captured and we weren't adding a new dwelling um, because there was net, net zero. Um, and then places where maybe it was an SFD permit, but it was actually multifamily because there's more than one unit on the lot, uh, things, things like that. So um, first example, uh, this was an undeveloped vacant lot uh, at the time of the BLI. It was still vacant when the permit was uh, submitted. So it was for a new SFD with an attached garage and the lot was 0.61 acres. And so because it was over 0.5, it was flagged for us to review. Um, but when we looked at it, it's fully zoned R1 and it's fully in the low des density residential plan designation. There was no committed or protected areas um, on the lot. And so our determination was that it was fully developed and um, the density calculations in land track were correct because uh, we didn't need to take into account any committed or protected areas for net density. Um, and we, so basically we reviewed it, but we, we didn't have to make any changes in the system. And we concluded that the auto populated data uh, was accurate in this case. So I'll pause. and see if anyone has any questions. Right. I don't see any hands. Okay. Anyone? No? Okay. I'll keep moving. Don't be shy if you have a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for multifamily dwellings, we reviewed all of the multifamily dwelling um, permits uh, and we reviewed them for accurate proposed use to make sure so, you know, if it was it actually an apartment complex one to four units, or was it five to 19 or 20 plus, um, we manually entered any existing dwellings uh, because basically there was just sort of complexity with multifamily development and auto populating that data. So we manually entered any existing dwellings. Um, we reviewed the density. We um, reviewed whether something should be flagged as potential student housing. So if there were more than three units and it wasn't within West University or South University neighborhood, we flagged those as potential student housing um, and projects that had uh, a project or development name that was very like <laughs> student, student housing LLC, <laughs> very clear that, that it was student housing. Um, and then looked at development incentives as, as we've gone over. So MUPD and brownfield assessments and things like that. So here, this is an example at 14th and Kincaid. 
Presbyterian student housing. Um, and so this permit came in for 45 units. It was only one tax lot, which makes things a lot simpler to review. Um, and it was replacing a church. So you can see the 2013 aerial and then the 2019 aerial um, where the church was demoed and the building was developed. So at the time of the BLI, it was developed, um, but it's, so it's one lot, totally zoned R4 and high density, density residential plan designation. Um, and there were no existing dwellings uh, when the new development was built. And there's no protected or committed uh, areas on the lot. And, um, and so the auto calculation for the density should be okay. So checked all of those things in terms of auto calculation and determined that they all looked good but we were also monitoring whether a permit was a demolition and a redevelopment based on assumptions in the UGB analysis. So we manually checked a box in the software to flag any demo redevelopment permits. Um, and so for this one, we, we flagged the demo redevelopment and then we also have to, had to manually flag potential student housing, which this also qualified under. Um, and that was our review for this multifamily permit example. Lisa. Hi, thank you, Lena. Um, actually, I have a question about the single family dwelling slide. My mind always goes to the what ifs. Uh -huh. I'm gonna ask you a what if question. Yeah, this one, thank you. So, I understand how this was determined as fully developed. That makes sense. But I'm curious, what if, what would have happened if this house was an old home built like in the 1930s, a small home on the same lot? Would the, do you think the determination would have been different just because it was a smaller footprint? So if it was, if it was an, like a new permit that came in with a mm -hmm. soup small house. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> um, so for, yeah, so for any lots less than half an acre, we didn't review that at all. So if it was a really, really tiny house on less than half an acre, we assumed that, we assumed the whole half acre or however 0.3 or however big the lot was. Mm -hmm. But if this had been a tiny house only taking up about half, if there was, so if there was more than half an acre left on the property that was empty and not developed, then we would have flagged that as partially vacant mm. and only accounted for the BLI impact of where the actual footprint of the buildings and development was. Mm -hmm. So just thank you. And then just taking a step further. So let's just say a person wanted to build a tiny house and have a huge garden. No, that was their style of living. And then that person passes away and the descendants want to sell this property. Then this property, because of the determin <laughs> sorry, determination, could be rezoned and divided up for more housing. Is that a correct assumption? I don't know how to answer that. I'm gonna help make Heather jump in. Thank you. Heather, do you have an answer on that? Yeah, she's trying to unmute herself. Let's see. Oh, there you go. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, <laughs> sorry. My picture was gone. So I was like, ah. um, you'd think I'd have this down at this point. Um, yes, so um, what would happen? It is, I mean, if it meets, if the lot meets the minimum standards for dividing into more than one lot, um, which includes like it has to have an you know both lots have to have enough frontage along the street and they have to have a minimum lot size then nothing that we're doing prohibits that from happening 
Um, and in fact, in the UGB analysis, we made assumptions, we actually assumed that some infill would happen on small developed lots. Um, so what we're trying to do now is figure out how much infill, whether that's from a land division or an accessory dwelling that didn't require a land division, um, how much of that has happened. Um, and so for low density residential, which this lot is, um, infill was defined as new housing that happens on lots that are identified in the BLI as developed and that are an acre or less in size. And so in the example you gave where, um, you know, it's, let's say it's over half an acre, it's, let's say it's under an acre and they put a small house on it and then they come in and divide it and they put another house on it. Um, if it, if that lot, if that small house had happened before we ran the BLI and we had identified it as developed, then that new house we would capture in our monitoring results and say, hey, look, infill happened, we'll put it in that bucket. But nothing we're doing in monitoring is saying you can't divide that lot now because we've designated it as, we've said that there's no um, space for a house on it. There's All we're doing is trying to estimate the likelihood of additional, um, well, how much new capacity has happened and what's the likelihood that more of it will happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah. I guess I was thinking about, well, I was, forget the house built 2000, 2001. 2001, that yeah. you know, allows for divisions to encourage multifamily or, or more density, there we go. And I'm just trying to tie the dots in my own head. Yeah, so we will have to look at um, whatever code amendments we adopt as a city um, and determine how much additional capacity is likely to happen as a result of those code amendments. And so there's a span, um, right, of um, are they going to be, are the code amendments going to be the minimum that the state requires, or are there going to be less restrictions and more incentivized um, middle housing? And so I think that's kind of what's going through the process right now. And we don't, we can't make any assumptions about that until we, um, until we see what code amendments get adopted. Um, but that's why we do the monitoring program, because every time code amendments happen that affect the developability of our land, we want to incorporate that in our future planning. But at this point, we're not really, we're kind of not really doing future planning per se. We're just trying to understand what the, what has developed um, and not overestimate the amount of development. You know, so that's why we did that cutoff of okay, we're not gonna look at lots that developed that were less than half an acre. We're just gonna assume that those are fully developed. But we wanna make sure we look at larger lots that have building permits on them because it's, it's likely that some of those, if not all of them actually didn't redevelop the whole lot because it was a large lot. So we wanna make sure we right size the amount of development we're seeing that that building permit took up because there is still room for more development. Thank you, that helps. Can I ask a quick question? I'm gonna put myself in the queue. So Heather, and, and this might get too wonky, but I'm just thinking about the work that we're doing, the planning commission right now is doing on house built and on, you know, going through implementation of house bill 2001 and um, for middle housing, the lot sizes will be significantly smaller. I mean, we have um, for certain middle housing types, they'll be quite small. And then with the new Senate bill 458, that actually allows you to divide those, um, like you can take, I, I, and I'm just mentioning this for those of you who don't know, but uh, you'll be you'll be able to land divide middle housing types. So if you have a duplex on one piece of property, you'll be able to split that into two individually owned duplexes on their own pieces of property. 
And so I'm just kind of thinking through how smaller lot sizes, for example, um, you know, for a, for a, I mean, gosh, I'm trying to remember what the smallest, I mean, they're quite like 1500 square feet, I feel like was, was this small, was a, was a lot size um, for some of the middle housing type. And so I'm just kind of thinking about how that plays into this and, or are we really not we're really kind of trying to focus on the information that we have at this point. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're kind of doing, you know, this is that issue of we're trying to take the assumptions that we had before and say, okay, is our development happening? Not going to happen, but what has happened compared to what we expected to happen? So that's what we're doing right now. It's just yeah. monitoring trends that have happened. Okay. Then once council says, great, thank you for this amazing growth monitoring report, um, we are gonna direct you to redo your UGB analysis. And that's when we get to go, okay, let's take those assumptions that we made before and then what we've seen over the monitoring period, and then new things that are coming into play, like the House Bill 2001 code amendments, and put those all together and make new assumptions about how we're going to grow. So, you know, everything that's adopted now, all those assumptions, how many units we need, how much we'll get from the infill and redevelopment, that's all going to change. Um, because we'll have monitoring data and we'll have things like House Bill 2001 or whatever. I mean, there whatever changes have happened that affect the buildability of land. Okay. Yeah. So I know it's so hard because we know that this is coming, but right now we're just kind of like, okay, what has happened? We want to get right what has happened so that it informs that next step, which we're not at yet. Okay. John, you have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, just kind of piggybacking on that. House Bill 2001 has a, a safe haven for the amount of development that, that it will do. I think it's a 3% is what you can assume will be uh, densified in your, in your existing BLI. So it, it's built in to it right now. What we'll find out with monitoring in the next, probably, it's not going to be at, at when this report comes out, or even when we start doing our UGB study, that'll probably, we'll probably use the safe haven. It'll be 10 years from now, we'll see how much is actually being used that way. Ed, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, John's actually correct, but it's up to 3%. It can be from zero to one and a half, all the way up to no longer than three. And uh, when we're going back to permits, I appreciate it going back to 2012, but I keep thinking, you know, in 2012, housing was coming out of a pretty deep recession. And I keep thinking that it would be nice to know back when the housing market was balanced about six or seven months worth of inventory and it was balanced between we, lost Ed, we, lost you. Ed, we just lost you oh he froze Ed, we can't hear you at all and now you're frozen I don't think he would. Okay. I, I just think that would be great information to have. Just a comment, though, not a request. I am just going to jump in because, Ed, we only caught half of what you said. But even with that half, I think by when we get to the housing permit um, results, um, keep that thought because we may have some of the information that you're looking for in the housing permit results when we get to the end of um, this conversation. So bring that up again, because I think you might be frozen again and we only caught half of what you said. All right, I'm gonna let Phil ask a question and um, Ed can clarify. Well, I, think, I, think, I think what Ed was getting at was, 
you know, maybe not starting at 2012 and going back further in time to when there was some, you know, more stable housing market. I don't know when that would be because we were in such a bubble pre uh, recession in 2008. So I'm not sure exactly what he, he'd define that as, but I think that was what he was getting at. I have a question though about if we could go forward now back to, to the multifamily stuff. Um, and okay, potential student housing. So remind me if you would, I mean, we, we do count student housing as part of our housing inventory or that's considered transitory or, or, you know, is there any kind of qualification for student housing or you're otherwise wisely trying to tease out what are these, you know, targeted student housing developments. Um, and I have a couple of follow-up questions kind of related to that too. So if I could start with that. Yeah, so um, it all depends on what your definition of student housing is, right? Um, so they're um, dorms, so publicly provided dorms. Um, those are considered group quarters. We'll talk again more about this at the um, later, but um, <clears throat> group quarters are, in, just this is always my favorite dorms nursing homes and jails those are our top three go-getters for group quarters um and so those are separate those are not included when we're talking about new dwellings even though we have to do a density calculation for them in the zoning code we don't count those as new market dwellings we accommodate those in a different way <clears throat> if they're a new dwelling unit so they have their own kitchen they have their own bathroom um that is a new dwelling unit regardless of if it's geared towards students um if it's you know five bedrooms where they all have their own entrance and then they have a shared facility that's one unit um if it's a duplex a triplex you know whatever those are all just individual units um during the ugb process because of um, a lot of the private student oriented apartments that were being developed around the university, there was a lot of question about how much of the new multifamily housing that was being built was really more geared towards students and not um, not geared towards the rest of the community. Um, <clears throat> and we had a lot of conversation about how to define that without um having to look at every permit and make a determination um, of whether or not we think it's student housing and so where we landed and this we can talk more about this um, down the road but where we landed as elena said was first of all we're calling it potential student housing um not that it is student housing um, we identified anything in the um with three or more units <clears throat> and in the West University neighborhood or in the South University neighborhood, or if it was specifically marketed, um, you know, by name developer, you know, project name developer, those kinds of things um, to students. Um, and so we're trying to get at that because we know that there's a lot of interest in that, but, but in reality, as far as UGB planning goes, um, multifamily housing is all put into one bucket if it's not group quarters. Okay, so so let me make sure I'm clear on this. Group quarters do not include dorms. They do include. I mean, dorms. I'm sorry. Group group quarters do not include dorms or jails or nursing homes, right? Uh, no, group no, quarters sorry, take, are. Yeah, I'm sorry. Take that back. That's group quarters. Yes. Student housing, though, that is not in a dorm. So if you have the five leasable, lockable uh, bedrooms with a gaming center in the middle that they call a den, um, that, you know, and I can see three of them outside my window here that are either built or going up. Those are potential student housing. They're just considered multifamily dwellings. You're going to count them however many units they are how, regardless of how many bedrooms and those just get in the bucket of multifamily dwellings is that correct they do okay and 
insofar as we're not talking yet about incentives, that's going to come up later. But in the memo, there were a couple of references to MUPTI. And I think there was uh, something on the fourth page of that memo that talked about downtown programs and MUPTI. Um, could you remind me, is, is MUPTI uh, geographically exclusive within Eugene? I mean, there, yes. there had been projects that were funded by MUPTI previously that are outside the boundaries of downtown. But currently, or going forward, they are not. Is that correct? There's a map, and um, I believe that MUPTI was revamped at the time that um, we did the UGB analysis, actually, um, to say that it couldn't be student housing focused. Right. And so some of the earlier projects that we are counting um, are both student housing and got MUPTI, and but then after I think it was 2013, maybe it was that um, that changed. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks, appreciate it. Anybody else? Okay, I don't see any hands. Wait, one one quick question. Oh, John, go ahead. Um, you, I, as far as counting student housing, we're, we're still counting them as as multifamily, but we're also putting another check mark next to them that it is potential student housing. I'm wondering why you left out Fairmont neighborhood and uh, and then what neighborhood is Franklin Boulevard in? I know I know that that a, a J, like Garden Way is Franklin or is Fairmont, but like the new development that is going in, the two new developments that are going in on Franklin, is that uh, is that West University? Or is that an unneighborhood association? I don't think it is, but we could have captured those from the name of the project or the developers. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I was gonna ask about too, because it's not just those two neighborhoods and the ones that might fall kind of in between that are around Franklin Boulevard that clearly are student housing projects. But there's also some that, you know, all of the stuff around Autzen Stadium, which is in a different neighborhood, is that given the check mark of student housing or at least some of those um, developments? Yeah, if there was any new permits there since 2012, that's what we were reviewing. I think a lot of those are older, but. Okay. okay. But yes, they would be flagged. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right, move on to development rates. So we also reviewed all development sites, which were a lot more complicated than <laughs> one permit on one lot. So uh, development sites had, or is anything that had multiple permits on a project site, um, and these permits might be issued over multiple years. Um, we determined the BLI impact for these permits, um, and there's permits with different uses, different zones and different plan designations. So reviewing to make sure that um, we've captured the correct impact on the correct uh, place, basically use zone designation. And then looking at the density over the whole site. So the density is the existing units plus the new units minus any removed units plus any future units that we knew about at the time the permit is submitted. Um, so those are kind of like the big, big overview things we looked at when reviewing development sites. So next slide. An example I put here is the Fifth Street Market District expansion. So there were four permits that came in for the hotel, for the apartment building, for the market building, and then for the canopy over the middle. Um, and so obviously a development site. Um, at the time the permits were submitted, there were only three tax lots, um, but there are now currently four. And so remember we were reviewing um, the permits sort of at, with a snapshot in time perspective when they're being applied for what were the circumstances and make sure, make sure, making sure we're capturing all that information as if we were reviewing that permit, if it was coming in when it, when it did come in. 
Um, so having to look and kind of do some of that research, like looking at our, our lid for the tax law configurations and, and things like that. Um, so then confirming um, that the new uses are being associated with the correct lots confirming that the new dwellings and the new employment building square footage are associated with the correct lots and the correct use. And then looking at BOI impact. Um, so here we have different uses sort of in a vertical manner um, on different levels of these buildings. And so for BOI impact, we um, attributed uh, the impact for each tax lot to the primary use in each of those buildings. So instead of sort of going in and totally divvying it all up, we said that the BLI impact was associated on um, with the use of the hotel, even though there's also a restaurant in that area. So a little bit of an 80-20 rule, which Heather will go into more on the next slide, but um, so yes. Um, and then there were a number of committed portions of these lots, but we had just needed to check and make sure that they were applicable to the development. They were, they were newly vacated right of way. And then confirming that both the Brownfield assessment and MUD incentives applied to this project and to these tax lots. So those are kind of all the big things that we went through. Um, and really, so really just looking at the permits, looking at all the different uses, looking at the new units and the new employment square footage and making sure that we're associating them with all of the correct tax lots in our system. And that's it for me at the moment. Bill. So going forward, I mean, or when you kind of would look, you, you pull apart these permits and you know you're gonna have housing in here that's one of these permits, although it's a mixed use format. So you're gonna be able to assign I mean, does any part of this really go toward the, the residential building, land, buildable lands inventory, or since it's mixed use in kind of a, a downtown or a commercial um, zone, uh, I'm not sure how this is designated or zoned uh, in that area, but is it sort of like, hey, we get housing units, 127 housing units out of this, and it's just gravy. It's not even counted in the BLI. The fact that we've got more units, it's great. Or is it counted and, and put into this bucket that's part of the residential, you know, addition. And then otherwise all the other stuff that's ground floor commercial and the office and retail and the hotel is all put in the bucket for employment. So that's my question. I think that that you just said it correctly, that it would, that the you new units go into the residential bucket and the new employment square footage and the retail and everything goes into the employment development. Um, and you will see this um, when we get to the net when we get to the next set of charts because we did we do have a chart that looks at dwelling units that um, the new dwelling units by plan designation. Um, and we did make assumptions about new dwelling units, um, how many would happen in commercial plan designations. So. Okay. Well, and let me, let me kind of piggyback one more question. So again, prospectively going forward, let's just say, and I think this is gonna happen in a few years, if I'm not mistaken, the Phoenix Inn gets converted back to Bushnell University it's no longer going to be a hotel. It's now going to be housing for students. Then you're going to, the BLI will kind of take that out of one bucket and put it in another, correct? Yeah. So um, it, um, conversions are interesting. So I don't know if this is what you're getting at. It might not be. But in that scenario, if it's a building that is um, a hotel and then they they didn't do any 
um, redevelopment. They just did interior work in the building. So it's a change of use to new dwellings. We would capture those new dwellings and we would say that they took no, they had no impact on the buildable lands inventory. So we got a hundred units without um, developing land. So that would be a form of redevelopment that just um, was like infill. Um, we've had some weird things like that. I think we may have talked about in the memo where some building square footage was added because buildings actually added mezzanines for offices. Um, and so we were like, well, so it added building square footage, but the building itself didn't change. And there was no new parking that took up more land or anything like that. So we, so that's where there's kind of some gravy happening where you're getting new capacity without land being um, taken up, which is pretty cool. Oh, Sue, you have your hand up, go ahead. All right, I, actually I have a comment more than a question. I don't have a question, I have a comment. I think this is astonishing work. And um, I think it's amazing that you have been able to anticipate all of the potential iterations that could possibly happen. And yet we can still as a group come up with different ones. I think that's pretty alarming. <laughs> um, but I love what's happening here because um, this is creating a foundation for being able to go forward with a lot of the changes that will happen culturally over time. And we've never done this before. I mean, this has never been done before. Data has never been collected at this level before. And um, I think it's pretty incredible that the city has committed itself to doing it and is making it happen. And I'm, I'm, I'm relieved because it gives me hope for how to manage the whole um, urban growth boundary and uh, all the planning decisions that have to be made in the future. So I really commend staff on the detail of this. I personally, when I read the, the document that was given to our materials today, I just thought, oh my God. You know, if you didn't know a little bit about some of this, it, it'd be like reading, you know, Greek or Turkish or I don't know, something. It'd be like reading some very foreign language. Um, I'm just very encouraged that your work is being done at this level. Thank you. I agree, very impressive. I don't have any other hands up. I'm passing to Heather then. Okay. Um, yeah, and you know, again, we apologize for that memo. <laughs> um, you know, it, I think it seems so easy, right? Like we just need a database where we can put the data in and we should be able to automate some things. And then you realize when you get in there and those of you that have worked with software and software development know this already, but this was all new to me that, um, you know, software just like GIS and mapping is so precise. And so there's, it's kind of like building a house. There's a thousand, what is it? 10,000 decisions you have to make when you build a house. And I feel like we had to do that. And that memo was some of us, some of um, us just documenting those decisions because it was shocking kind of how many times we either had to um, and I will talk about the 80-20 rule, but, you know, really, um, really, it just wasn't as easy as we had hoped. Um, and, and automating things, getting it so that, like Sue was saying, we, it's not too onerous for staff, right? So you have to find that balance of being, able, collecting more data than we have. So it's already going to be more work than staff has done before, um, but also not, collecting it in a way or too much that the data is not going to be right because staff don't time, have time to do that level of detail. And so trying to find that level of balance going forward um, was pretty challenging and we couldn't really do that very well in the backfill um, because we were backfilling data. But that's why I'm going to talk about the 80-20 rule because we had defined opportunities um, really to 
um, I don't want to say find opportunities to not review every permit, but um, when you're dealing with thousands of permits, you have to find which are the ones that we need to review. Um, so Elena went through some specific examples um, of the detailed manual review we did. And as we documented in the packet memo, um, you know, we couldn't review everything in detail as if we were reviewing that permit right now, right then, um, which will happen going forward. Um, so we had to make some reasonable decisions um, that we wanna make sure we, make sure you hear, understand if you have any questions um, or concerns, please um, definitely let's talk about them. So as you know, there was a bunch of data that was auto-populated. Um, because we are reporting on data um, annually, instead of like at, at the minute, but we're reporting on it annually, um, we decided to auto -pop the data that we could auto-populate, we did it um, annually. So what I mean by that is all the permits that came in in 2013, or were issued in 2013, we auto-populated um, the tax lot data, the zoning, all of those auto-populated things based on the conditions of the tax lot layer and the zoning layer and all of those things at the end of 2013. So does that mean that there could be instances where a permit came in in January of 2013 and because we use tax lot data from December 31st of 2013, the tax lot data is not exactly right? Yes, that does mean that. Um, but we actually found a positive from that, which was that Sometimes um, building permits get submitted, particularly for single family homes, before the tax lot layer has been updated to reflect the subdivision that has happened. And so if you, um, if you uploaded the tax lot data right at the time the building permit was submitted, you would get this large lot for the tax lot, but actually by uploading the tax lot data, you know, at the end of the year, sometimes the tax lot layer had caught up and already reflected that, that the building permit for that single family home was coming in on a newly subdivided lot. Um, if it didn't capture that still, then that's some of the information that um, Elena was talking about where we wanted to make sure we reviewed large lots because we knew that this was an issue. So anyway, that, that, um, that is something we had to do. There's other reasons, um, but it did mean that we knew that there, that there could be some issues with that. And we tried to find those issue areas by using those queries that we talked about looking for special circumstances. Um, in some areas, we really did 100% review, not what I call the 80-20 approach, um, or close to it given, you know, likely human error. Um, so for example, we reviewed all accessory dwelling unit permits to make sure that they were actually, in the end, issued as an accessory dwelling. And that's because, historically, um, we have seen that um, a permit has been submitted for an accessory dwelling unit, and then folks have come in to pick up the permit, and they've seen the fees associated with it, and they've said, never mind, I don't want this to be its own separate accessory dwelling unit, please, you know, I want to change my permit and not get charged those fees. And so they, the plans will get redlined, and they will you know, not build the kitchen, and we will inspect that they didn't build the kitchen. Um, and, but then the building permit might still say in our building permit system that it was an accessory dwelling, even though it didn't get approved as that. And it's very clear. It's just sometimes there's a data mismatch from the initial submittal. So that's one where we did 100% of making sure that those were actually accessory dwellings. But with thousands of permits um, that we could potentially review, we had to find those reasonable opportunities for reviewing something like 80%, thinking that the last 20% 
um, would be ones that would be more simple, shouldn't have as many issues, and wouldn't get us much more accuracy, but would take a lot more time. And as you all know, um, we are behind schedule. And so, um, and we have other projects going on that um, staff need to be working on. So those queries that we um, talked about in the memo were used to flag permits as we discussed for manual review because they had those certain characteristics that we knew we should look at. Um, even with that, we did not review or do um, data input on um, specific areas or or permits with certain characteristics that are on this slide. So for instance, uh, I think Elena mentioned this, simple, what we call simple single family permits um, or what's called tenant infills permits where um, you're not changing the building footprint or anything outside the building. Um, you're just infilling with a new use. Um, we didn't review those unless they were otherwise flagged through those special queries, like it was a large lot or it was a split plan designation or it had existing dwellings that were imported, all of those things um, that were flags for us. Um, for the buildable lands inventory impact, so how much did the development really develop of our inventory. This is what we were talking about before, um, Lisa, where, um, you know, I think because of our conversation, we kind of already covered this, but basically if it's less than an acre, we didn't go back in and say, well, how much did that building really develop? We just assumed it's a half acre, it's less than a half acre, 0.499 acre, then 0.499 acre was developed with that house or commercial building or whatever. And that was even for on property, that makes a lot of sense, I think, for vacant property and property that had been identified in the BLI as partially vacant. Um, for developed property, it gets a little bit trickier because um, there is no way that all the permits, which were not a ton, but it, that all the permits that came in on small lots, I'm just going to say less than a half an acre, that were developed in the BLI flattened their building that was on there and redeveloped it. A lot of them are going to be additions um, or, you know, um, Maybe they did demo the building. Um, maybe it was a little bit of both. Um, and so we have some mechanisms that we're working on to try to um, flesh that out a little bit better in the data. We didn't make a whole bunch of assumptions, adopted assumptions going forward about um, how much capacity we would have through redevelopment, um, but we still want to, we need to narrow that down a little bit more. Um, we also, if the density was coming in pretty close to the minimum allowed or pretty close to the maximum allowed, even if it was a little bit less or a little bit more than the minimum or maximum allowed in the zone, we didn't review it. Um, part of that is because, you know, um, Right now, the R2 zone um, has a higher minimum density than it did before we adopted the UGB because we actually increased the minimum density threshold in R2 zones as part of our UGB adoption process to fit more houses in, or more housing inside the UGB. And so what we, what we saw is that there's a lot of development that's happening that was approved before the UGB um, so it got a land use approval, like a subdivision or a planned unit development before those minimum thresholds were in place. Um, so again, we just tried to use that 80-20 rule. Um, most multifamily permits, um, we ended up adjusting in some way because we had to deal with um, things like existing dwellings. Um, and the fact that there were multiple dwellings through multiple permits over the whole site. 
again, for those small lots, we did not um, track new employment square footage on those just for the larger lots with, again, the assumption that one, we've never had this data before. So having it on large lots is really good and that they probably have more bang for the buck um, on the larger lots than they do on the smaller lots as far as additional capacity that's created. Um, the BLI impact estimate, so how much of um, the land is developed as a result of this permit. Um, for the older permits, we actually had the benefit of looking at aerial photos um, because we have annual aerial photos. And so, you know, for those 2013 through 2018 permits, a lot of them, we were able to really easily measure out how many acres were developed on, um, on that site because we could see the new development on the new aerial photo and we could see how the old development on the year before. Newer permits were harder because um, newer developments not reflected on the new aerial photos yet. And so we based that on things on basically on the um, building square feet, parking areas, things like that shown on the site plans and using aerial photos, but it was less precise. And then net dwellings and net employment building square footage. Um, again, just this is a net, so it's not new dwellings and new employment square footage, but we really did try to um, account for demolitions. Um, we used that, we used, again, looking at site plans, we looked at um, credits that you get for your system development charges. So um, you get charged system development charges for um, new development happening on the system. And a lot of times that's by building square feet. Um, but if you already had some building square building on your property and it got demoed, then you get a credit for however much got demoed. So we tried to use things like that in aerial photos to get a, a good estimate of the net employment square footage or net new dwellings. And then um, like Elena, I think was demonstrating on the um, Fifth Street development, dividing up uses by tax lot and zone and plan designation where we needed to. Um, you know, that was a good example of a mixed use building where um, you've got vertical uses happening. We're not gonna try to decide, oh, well, the ground floor is in commercial, so let's allocate, you know, a quarter of the acreage of being developed to that and then three quarters to the apartments. We basically considered um, whatever was the smaller use as an accessory and that the main driver of it was um, whatever the main use was. In some cases, they were exactly equal. And so in that case, we actually did split it up. If it was two, um, you know, two floors, one commercial and one apartments, then we just divided it in half. So we tried to use some reasonable, um, assumptions. Any questions on that? Ron Borofsky, go for it. Thank you. Um, I think you did a really good job on this. I guess one of the questions that I would have would be, and it probably falls into the 20% where we just can't capture it, <clears throat> would be changes of use. Right. So if I've got a I've got a house in a in a commercially zoned area or a neighborhood commercial, let's say, for example, and it's it's in our BLI as housing. And that changes to a coffee shop. Now we could probably capture that by change of use because they're gonna to have to get SDC, there's gonna be a change in their SDCs going from change of use. Would that be captured there? Or on the other hand, let's say that that church that we saw in the earlier slide that they tore down, um, let's say that that church goes from a church into a dwelling units, like what happened out on West Amazon where there was a church and St. Vincent de Paul turned it into, into dwellings. Is there a way that we're capturing change of use um, 
obviously on the bigger lots, we probably would, but on the smaller ones, is that something that's just going to fall into the 20%? So we, um, change of use, tenant infills, and generally alterations, those three types of permits, for the most part, are interior changes that happen that don't impact the buildable lands inventory. So from a standpoint of um, the acres developed as a result of those permits, that's a non-issue. But are we capturing those changes? Yes, we will have a building permit report that says, here's all the tenant infills that, that happened. Um, we won't necessarily have what the existing use was unless it was different enough that the planners had to review it because it really was a change of use. So if it's going from like retail to retail, it's just different kinds of businesses, it'll be in the list, but there won't be um, like what the existing use was and what the new use was. But if it's going from like restaurant to dwellings or church to dwellings, those, those kinds of things, we will have that information. Right, that's, that's what I was hoping, because not, not retail to retail, but if we're losing, yeah. some, if something's going from commercial to housing or housing to commercial, that, that would affect our calculations going forward. And I will talk about demolitions if we get to those charts um, coming up next. That was a teaser for you guys. Oh, you know, suddenly hands came up. Okay, I've got Phil and then Michelle. Um. Maybe just building upon that, there's a couple of bullets that are at the top of page six, I think, of the memo. And one refers to including building square feet of uses might seem less like employment buildings, such as lodging, hotels, and semi-public uses, churches. Churches are counted as employment lands or just the bucket of non-residential uses? Is that right? And then the second one, shipping containers counted as building square feet unless otherwise clearly marked as temporary use. Wow, is that, do we even have a whole bunch of that or what, you know? Only if they're you, I mean, we, we do, I mean, not a whole bunch, but we definitely had cases where shipping containers were being used as um, storage facilities, like a whole, and like a whole bunch of them came in and took over the whole site that was vacant and we're like, oh, and that was, that is their business use is they are a storage facility business. And so we said, yeah, I mean, yes, they're just setting those on the property, but they are, um, it is storage and it's, it's a storage. business. Okay, okay. But not a ton, you're right. Okay, all right, thanks. Go ahead, Michelle. Sun's blinding, okay. Um, you might have said this when I saw it on the first slide that you were using this data to compare what we thought we needed or, um, and I think that's where I maybe misunderstood you is to see those comparisons. Is that work not what we're going over tonight or am I just asking the question that you haven't gotten to yet? I'm, I'm trying to piece this in my mind, like the visual of like what um, I know what this means, but I'm curious what this data tells us with what we already knew, the comparison for that. And I was reading through this memo and I didn't quite see those numbers. So I thought maybe it's just not, we're not at that part yet. Okay. Yeah, you're totally spot on. We wanted to kind of go through the data and how we did it before we talked about the results, like the numbers and compared it to what we estimated, which we'll be able to do tonight for housing um, to some degree. And then, um, and then we'll have to come back to you with more results, but we didn't have them ready to give to you um, in the last packet. Okay, and then Mike, can I ask another question? Oh, but you also have hand up. What was the Fifth Street Market lot? I liked that example a lot. And obviously we know it just got built, but when before you did this process, what? What was it? How did it change? And I'm I'm trying to picture that one parcel as the example of like how to piece this all together for myself. And so what was that categorized as prior to this? I'm assuming just undeveloped. 
And like what did Elaine this is looking it up. Okay. I'm trying to remember. I think I was, it was um, developed. No, no, I'm just trying to explain the same thing to make sense for myself. But like what what about that tax lot did we learn? And I don't know. I, I think I'm confusing myself because I want to know more about how to use this data. So I'm trying to use that tax lot as an example of how to get there. So we learned that we have 127 new residential units that were developed. We learned that we had, I think it was like 16,000 new employment square footage. We learned that some of the incentives that the city is, is, has available are being utilized on that lot. So the Brownfield Assessment and MUPTI are, yeah. Um, and then, um, and then that, I don't have it in front of me um, in terms of whether that lot was developed already or not. I can look it up, but um, really just that. So we're capturing new BLI impact for all of the specific uses on that lot. So that's what I think. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of the picture. And I think it's a really good segue um, into the next, I wanna make sure you get your questions answered, but I'm hoping that the next, um, the next charts will at least help with the next piece of putting that together. Cause you're absolutely right. We haven't talked about, okay, so what, you know, what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I was getting, I was like, we're getting there. I know it, but I'm looking at all this data and reading it, which my gosh is amazing. And, and you know, Sue is right, if you don't know, you don't have the background on it. It's intense, also amazing work. So I was trying to look at it and say, I mean, it's great that we know all of this new, uh, all this new capacity, new building and everything. So I was just wanting to know how it, how it fit in to the bigger picture. And that was, so, but my question's answered. Thank you. I do not see any other hands up. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move us along then. Um, so hopefully this is helpful. Um, okay, so, um, so like, in that example that Elena was giving 127 new units, but what does that mean as far as our need goes, what we projected? Um, if we put it all together over the monitoring period, how much more do we still have to build? Um, how is it, you know, we projected cert certain amounts of housing happening on commercial land versus residential land. We projected um, a certain amount of housing happening that was multifamily and a certain amount happening that was single family. And so we have to take the results of all that, put it together, and then compare it to those assumptions that we made. Um, so the only set of permit results we're going to look at tonight, as I mentioned, is the number of new net new dwelling units and then what type of housing mix category um, those dwelling units are categorized into. And so we'll talk more about those categories, but just as a reminder, single family, as it's been called, titled <laughs> and will probably be retitled, but right now, single family um, attached single family, and then all other attached housing types go into the multifamily bin. Um, so next time we'll come back to you with more specific development details like um, the density of the, of the housing that has developed and how that compares to what we assumed. Um, incentives, we're gonna have to talk about next time. Um, and then how much, the, what we call the BLI impact. So how, much, how many acres have been developed as a result of those permits? And how many acres do we have left? Um, so just as a reminder, this is new data that um, in that we actually have net new dwellings. So as Elena talked about existing 
dwellings that were on the site and then the new dwellings through the permit and then minus any dwellings that were demolished. Um, previous housing numbers that we have um, pulled from our building, our um, existing building permit system were new dwellings. Um, we didn't have a way to capture net new dwellings before. Um, so it, while we'll be showing historical data, um, there's a little bit of a discrepancy there. And one of the things um, one of you brought up was the replacement of um, housing, the demolition of housing units being replaced by um, employment uses. And right now, um, so we'll be looking at about 8,000 dwelling units is what we're gonna be talking about. And of those, about 43, or not of those, in addition, 43 dwellings were demolished and replaced by non-residential uses that we could find um, over the monitoring period. And those aren't reflected in these numbers right now. We're going to fix that. Um, but I just wanted to kind of acknowledge that because these numbers will change ever so slightly. And then as we talked about before, um, these numbers will exclude group quarters. So when we're talking about new dwellings, we are not talking about um, group quarters, dorms, jails, nursing homes, um, assisted care facility that isn't its own, um, their own apartments. Okay, here we go. So um, this first chart that I'm going to put up is net new dwellings that we've seen annually over the monitoring period. So on the right hand side, these are our monitoring years. Um, there are some permits in 2012 that we had to count, not all of them, but some of them, um, because they weren't reflect, reflect, their development wasn't reflected on the buildable lands inventory. Um, and all the way through um, I believe this is through June of this year. And so this is what I was talking about, that we've got historical years, new dwellings, and then this monitoring years is net new dwellings. Um, so just to orient you a little bit more, um, this gray line here is the average number of dwelling units that we would need to produce, or not produce, um, that the community would need to produce um, per year to meet our target of 15,105 new dwellings by 2032. And what you're seeing, this black line, is the average dwelling units that we've produced um, to date, excluding these partial years, because we don't want to include those right now, um, because they're partial year data. Um, and so what we've seen is 914 dwellings per year um, on average, compared to 755 um, that we would need to meet our target. So we're about 160 dwellings per year higher than um, than what we were projected to need. Um, and we'll, you'll hear this as a common theme as we go through these slides. However, over the next 11.5 years, so we're about 8.5 years into the monitoring period, 11, the next 11.5 years, there is likely to be um, some slowing of um, development because of reasons I'll touch on a little bit more. Um, but I think you can actually see it pretty well in this chart in that you can see that housing production is not linear. It's not linear like this line. Um, it is very, um, it goes in waves and multifamily housing happens differently than single family housing. Um, but that's what we're seeing right now. Um, we are in a period of kind of high growth. I think, um, Ed, you might have mentioned this earlier, talking about what we saw when we were producing a lot of single family housing in the early 2000s, and then we had a recession. Um, and so actually single fa family housing went down. Most of this is multifamily housing. 
Um, but, but overall, you can see that there is kind of this um, up and down that happens. So I can come back to any of these, but I, um, I'm just gonna try to get through these. Um, so now what you're seeing here is um, the total number of dwelling units. So um, that we saw here, here's what we saw historically in 2001 through 2012. And here's what we've seen during the monitoring period. So almost 8,000 units, as I said. And then within that total, what percentage of those units were single family detached? What percentage were multifamily? And what tiny little percentage here were single family attached, which is essentially row houses and condos if um, they came in when the building permit was submitted, it was already a condo development. Um, then what you're seeing, I'm ignore this for a minute, then what you're seeing here, Michelle, this is our, um, I hope this is kind of what you were thinking about. This is what we adopted as our forecast for 2012 to 2032. So the mix we adopted was 55% of our new housing would be single fam family detached, 8% would be single family attached, and 37% um, for a total of 45% would be attached housing types. What this, this bar is showing us is if we assume that this same trend continues over the 20 year period, what would happen? So we'll, if things happen just like this 8.5 years for the next 11.5 years, you see that um, the percentages are essentially the same. We just carried those over. And then the average of 914 units per year would continue for 20 years. And you see that um, we would be above the 15,000 pretty significantly. Um, let's see, uh, we already talked a little bit about this. Housing development is cyclical. And so this is kind of what is a challenge with, um, this is, I think I forecasted that this is where it's gonna be really hard is that we're looking at a monitoring period and it is really helpful, as Ed was pointing out, I think it is really helpful to look at longer term trends because if you just look at your monitoring period and it's not very long, you could really be missing a longer term um, averaging out of what's happening. You might be in a boom or you might be in a low level of production. And so that's what's going to be hard to um, discuss or to zero in on as we look at these numbers. The other thing I want to mention about the multifamily housing is that, um, and we talked about this earlier, is that there has been since you know, at least 2012 and earlier, this common belief that multifamily housing should be slowing down um, because a lot of the multifamily housing, especially back then, was particularly marketed towards student housing, like we talked about earlier and around the university. And that trend is really still continuing. Um, but at some point, and this is kind of the question, at some point that it's a very specific market um, and it's, um, it can't continue at that pace. The, the, the common refrain is that it can't continue at the pace that it has been indefinitely, especially if the university isn't projecting um, continued to grow a lot. Okay, and so this one I just took off the historical data to kind of let you know, to make it easier so that you could see what was going on here compared to the other ones. So right. um, I, now we're uh, Heather. Oh, sorry, no, John's got his hand up. I, I figured. Oh yeah, that. thank you. I can't see any of that. Oh, that's okay. Thank you. So a couple of questions. Um, 
one are when you're taking these numbers so i looked at you know this year's numbers aren't in there when you take these numbers and put them into your data is it when the complexes get their occupancy permit or is it when they submit their building permit neither it's when the building permit is issued so we don't do submittal because it feels like once the building permit is issued is closer to when um, the building is actually happening um, than submittal because they're not um, approved for the for the development yet. So, for example, the two big apartments that are going up on Franklin, those are in the data because there's shovels in the ground. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, have you done any modeling on pulling those big complexes out and looking at what the actual single family, multifamily percentages are? Because um, that would be something that I would be interested in is, you know, we've got a very skewed multifamily. And in my mind, it's because it's because we're getting some of these ones that are two, two, three hundred units at a whack along Franklin Boulevard. Um, and so I would like to know, and those are targeted towards students, but I would like to know if the if you pulled those out, would the number of multifamilies that are being built outside of that area would put us back more towards a, a a ratio that we were expecting when we said 55 45. Um, and is there some way that we can look at that analysis? Since you are pulling out student family ones and identifying those, could we get a graph that shows multifamily excluding the uh, the units that are being built for the for the students? Um, yeah, that's why we have that flag for potential student housing so that we can see what that split is that's happening with multifamily. Um, I don't have that today, but, um, but that is why we have that flag. And, and the reason I'm, I want to make sure that, that that chart gets put in there is because there's a few touch points that are very important, especially in the political side of this. When, when it goes to council and when council sees these numbers that, you know, some people will say, oh my God, it's 7128, right? And if you don't have that other slide that says it's 70, yes, it is 7128 and we have 950 units per year as opposed to 750, they, people can take numbers and run with them. And we need to know that there's a, there is a housing, crisis in Eugene. And it's, there's not a housing crisis for student housing. There's a housing crisis for people who are not going to be in those apartments on Franklin Boulevard. And so if we, if we pulled those out and said, wow, instead of being at 55, 45, we're at 50, 50 or whatever, that's a more, to me, that's a more reasoned look to look at where we go if we decide to move forward with another UGD analysis. I don't have anyone else. So okay, thank you, Hi, Heather. <laughs> yeah, I'll... no, this is great. Um, and I knew there would be questions that we weren't able to answer tonight because we just have um, the mix um, and the number of units. Um, but don't kill my joy because I'm so happy that we are actually able to provide this to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Real quick, Phil's got his hand up. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I'd just like to amplify maybe what John is is asking for, because I think it does, I mean, just those charts kind of belie, I think, what's truly happening in the in the community. And if you see the, this thing, oh, well, you know, our target or our need is so many units, and we've, we've exceeded that. So, you know, we're, we're good to go. It's, it's not quite that simple. And I think this, this would uh, belie a lot of other things and, and factors that um, lead to our affordability problem that Howard brought up at the beginning of the meeting. I don't. I don't think there was a question there. Um, I 
did mention that we do have the student housing flag. We actually took a lot of effort to try to flag student housing related to this specific issue. Um, so we just don't have it at this meeting, I'm sorry. Um, but I hope that we can bring it back up by the next meeting. That's what I'm hoping. And then Heather, I have Ed has his hand up. Ed, you just unmuted and then you muted yourself again. So can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Is my volume good? Thank you. Um, the very first graph that you showed all the dwelling units uh, with the historical data involved, I, I think it'd be very, yes, that one. I think it'd be really interesting to see the exact same graph only with single family and then with multifamily. That's all. Yep, we've, we've got that. Um, I will try to bring that to the next one. Okay, that is all the hands. So, and we've okay. got nine minutes just to help. Ah. Okay. Um, okay, so, so breaking this last one down a little bit further, um what within these um this 8000 units that happened some of them happened you know they happened on different plan designations and we made assumptions about how many units would happen on each plan designation and also what mix those would be um and so to get to that okay so um, breaking it down further, what this shows is again, the number of new dwellings um, that happened or that permits were issued for in 2012, partial 2012 through partial 2021 in low density residential plan designations compared to um, the number that was assumed for the 20 year period. So 8.5 years versus 20 years in low density residential. And then again, the percentages with multifamily broken out just a little bit more to try to get at middle housing. 74% um, of new dwellings that we have seen have been single family detached in low density residential compared to 92% is what we assumed new dwellings in low density residential would be. Um, so let's see what's important to talk about here. Um, we categorize the way that these are broken out a little, as I said, a little bit more um, is that two to four dwelling units and five plus dwellings is really trying to get at the building, um, the number of units in the buildings um, on the lot. And so two to four unit dwellings are things like triplexes, quads that are on their own lot. Um, and then five or more units would be um, buildings over the whole lot. Um, the other thing to note is that there are some uses that um, don't clearly fit into one of these categories all the time, like a triplex is three units, it's always three units, so it always fits in here right now. <laughs> um, but there's things like um, specialized housing, which um, can be um, uh, affordable housing that is provided by a, um, a public um, nonprofit, and um, single room occupancies. Um, those are kind of funny types. Um, those could be two to four dwelling units, or they could be five or more. They're kind of their own thing. Generally, what we found is they fall into the five or more dwelling units is what those projects usually are. And so we just went ahead and put them in the five or more dwelling units. We had to kind of make some um, decisions about that. We don't see very many of either of those. And so um, where it's not clear, where it's kind of could go one way or the other, um, but that's generally where they fall. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to point out here is that we did also see some dwellings happening on non-residential uses where we or non-residential plan designations where we didn't actually have a forecast or an adopted um, amount to happen there. So um, there is some affordable housing that is um, developed by nonprofit providers that is happening on government and education land. That makes sense. Um, there is actually eight dwelling units that are happening on industrial, and those are mostly from like a security unit um, or uh, an apartment for a security um, person, employee, um, for something like a storage facility. That's pretty common, actually. Um, so we are seeing some units happening on industrial. And then um, parks and open space. Um, that sounds funny, but actually there is some land up in the South Hills that is, you know, near or could be actually be designated parks and open space. You remember that for UGB planning purposes, um, it's not the adopted plan designation of the property, it's a GIS representation of the plan designation. So it may or may not be parks and open space, but regardless, it's a platted piece of property and it's zoned R1, so they're allowed to put a home on it. So that's what's happening there. I think this is kind of noise. And so in the comprehensive report, I was thinking we would kind of leave this out. What's more interesting um, or what I think people wanna see is what's going on here because this is pretty different and not surprising given like we talked about earlier, the um, slower single family housing development that we've seen. And then on commercial, um, we did plan for about 1600 homes to happen on commercial and 100% of them would be over five units or more. And what we've seen is actually over 2000 units have happened on commercial, about 2200. And the, a majority of them, 97%, so this is pretty close, um, have been five or more units. So that's not surprising either. Um, but we have seen a lot of commercial development happening. And then um, I would say high density residential is um, at least quantity wise is pretty similar to what we projected. Um, medium density is a little bit lower. And I think um, part of that could be that some of our housing supply for medium density residential land doesn't actually have utilities. Um, it's not served yet out in the Crow Road area. And that's the same for low density residential. So I know we have two minutes. I have um, two more slides and the next steps. Um, I don't know if how people are feeling. Um, I actually have a meeting at 730, believe it or not. So okay. um, I may have to jump off early and I will kick it over to Michelle to wrap up if we need to do that. I, I apologize, you guys. I just I had to schedule back to back. So are it, are folks willing to stay for another five minutes? Okay. Can't see everyone. Can't so are you else. okay with uh, adjourning yes. us? Yes, sorry, I was talking to myself. Okay. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, awesome. Thank you um, and sorry about going over. That's okay. okay. I, will, I will hop off and not interrupt you all, so. So this next one is um, what happens, you know, we talked about, we had another chart where we showed what happens if the trend, the eight, you know, what we've been seeing in the monitoring years continues over the next 11.5 years of our monitoring period. And so this just does that. That's what this chart does. Again, you see our adopted forecast here for low density residential. And if what we've seen over the monitoring period continues over the next 20 or 11.5 years, we would um, hit about 6,000 homes in low density residential instead of the almost 9,000 that we assumed. Um, and then again, you would see this um, going 
well beyond um, what we anticipated for commercial and high density residential. Um, and just a reminder, like the average trend line that we saw original or not trend line, sorry, the average annual average line that we saw on the first chart and then these trend bars um, do not include partial, partial year data um, because it would throw off the, the div divisor that you're using to come up with a, a trend over 20 years or um, an annual average. Um, and then lastly, what does that mean for our total production? So what has been our total production compared to our total need of 15,000? So um, as we talked about, we have been in a faster period of growth, mostly around um, multifamily housing. Um, in this period, as far as all, you know, our 15,105 um, units that we need over 8.5 years, we've met about 53% of it. So we have a little less than half to go. For multifamily, um, it has been, you know, as we talked about developing, we're in a boom of multifamily right now. So it's been developing faster and we've actually developed um, to the target that we had till um, 2032. Um, single family detached, slower. We're in a slower period right now. And so you're seeing that reflected here. We've built 26% um, over almost half of the, the um, monitoring period, or yeah, of the 20 year period. And then single family attached, um, we had a pretty small amount that we were forecasting. We've only developed about 6.5% of that small amount. So this is where a whole bunch of those caveats come in and you guys have already been touching on those, right? If you just look at the numbers, somebody could just go, oh yeah, we're done with multifamily housing. Um, we don't need to build any more of that. Um, but here's some of the things that I wanna make sure we say, and then when we get to um, more discussion about connecting the dots between things, um, I think we'll have a lot more to say. Um, so first of all, remember the 15,105 units and then the mix that we're using, those are all based on um, a population forecast from 2012. So we're 8.5 years after that, we've got new forecasts, which, um, which are slower than we anticipated, but we're still growing. And so that's all gonna be part of the mix. Um, that 15,000 units, um, that is our target, um, did not take into account under production of housing that already existed in the community. Um, before it, it's only focused on addressing your growth. And that's because that's how the UGB rules are drafted. Um, but we know we have an underproduct, we already had an underproduction of housing, um, I think from the housing affordability issues that we have. And recently, um, the state commissioned a regional housing needs assessment. Um, that tried to look at not just how many housing units do you need to accommodate your growth, but how many housing units do you need to accommodate the underproduction that had already happened in your community. So you were already starting with a deficit and also to address um, the um, homelessness. And so when that was done for Eugene, even though it's draft numbers, um, it was done for the whole state and then it got parsed down to the city level. For Eugene, it ended up being about that we would need to produce about 30,000 housing units, which is double what we are planning for um, from 2018 through 2040. So again, not adopted, but it is the only information we have right now um, that really tries to put a number around under production. And I think is one of the things we have to remember when we're talking about this target versus a community target. 
Um, you all have brought this up. We have a tight rental market. We have a tight selling market. We've got housing affordability concerns. Um, so so um, saying that multifamily housing has been met, we may be meeting it for our regulatory requirements, um, but our housing overall is not addressing those other needs that we have. Um, and then again, like, and then again, hitting on that housing construction is often cyclical, um, and we probably will see um, production of multifamily housing go down. Um, single family housing, it, um, you know, multifamily housing often goes in waves. Um, single family housing is a little bit more tied as much of you all could talk more about um, tied to what's going on with the broader economy. Sometimes it happened, housing production for single family housing happens um, as a result of, a, of um, or impacts to it as the result of, the, of a recession or what happens may in that market may cause, you know, be the cause of a recession. So so, you know, we have a whole nother economic cycle that is likely to happen during our planning period. And so we're probably going to have some sort of downturn. We also have the pandemic <laughs> and the discussion is still kind of out on, you know, what impact that happen will have long term um, going forward. So. You know, I just feel like even though we're not at the, I'm just sharing numbers with you right now, we're not at the point where we have to say what we think those numbers mean. I, um, I felt like it's important to make sure that everyone knows we're not just going to put these numbers out here. The growth monitoring report will be an opportunity for us to say what we think these numbers mean in the context of other things like demographic changes, housing affordability, Etc. Sue? Sue, we cannot hear you. Right, I know. I just, I was trying to find my mouse so I could get to the mic. <laughs> um, I just, I want to thank you, Heather, for that, for your closing comments there. I think they are so important, what you just said, because it's going to be really easy to draw conclusions from this without being very thoughtful about what's behind it. And um, your comments about the under production in past years and homelessness and all of that, I, th I think it's just a really poignant and important comments and I really appreciate your making them. Also, it was worth waiting for all this information. <laughs> I think it's uh, fantastic and Thank you for all that it took to get to this point. I know there's a lot to do still, but this is pretty phenomenal. Sue, uh, are you uh, Phil and then John? Yeah, could we go back a slide? Um, I think maybe just one slide. Yeah, um, I'm just thinking, you know, for presentation purposes, maybe to other, um, you know, other audiences, um, the scale that you have here, you I think you might lose some interesting detail within the medium density residential uh, analysis, because I think the, the gross number of new dwellings that's um, um, in the single family uh, category or low density residential category kind of swamps it. So you really aren't, you know, it might be just easier to read um, if you were to have maybe kind of each one of the, I mean, you can show them like this where they're all together, but then maybe to kind of zoom in on one, then the other and the other, you can, you know, kind of tease out maybe some of these nuances and some of the uh, information behind the, the raw data that, that's worth talking about. So just a suggestion. John. Thanks. Um, yeah, <clears throat> for me, a uh, couple of questions. One, can you send out this slide deck so we have it uh, to look at more, more deeply? That would be helpful. Um, you know, the thing that jumped out to me on the last slide, when we looked at single family, you know, it, it looked like there were 
2,000 single family houses built uh, in, in eight years. And we uh, project that 250 a year. And we're projecting that we should be building 400 a year of single family. Um, so, you know, to me, what is, and, and multifamily you said is cyclical. I think single family is, has one of the things that, that helps drive this, and Ed could maybe speak to this more, is the availability of land and, and the, the cost of land. Um, and that's one of the things that um, UGB touches directly. Um, so, you know, if we see in the next couple of years that that's still at where it is, and we're, like you said, 30,000 under because of what we have missed, I don't know. I just, it's, it's going to be interesting to dig into these numbers. Um, also, will we... Since we are the technical advisory group, will we be seeing more raw data, or I mean raw numbers, as opposed to just charts and graphs um, as we go forward towards the, the final uh, document? Yeah, I've been trying to figure out um, how to make that available. And um, I think what's going to happen is you're going to get a giant spreadsheet. <laughs> Um, because we don't have a way to make Tableau um, available on the website yet. Uh, that's the goal, right? The ultimate end is that anybody is going to be able to download the data, whoever wants to get to that level of detail, but um, we're not able to do that yet. Um, so we're probably going to get a big spreadsheet. Well, as part of the old technical advisory group, we're used to looking at a lot of spreadsheets. <laughs> But thank you so much for the work. This is awesome. Anybody else have questions? Okay, Heather. Okay, so last piece real quick. Um, next steps. Um, so uh, as you might have guessed, um, we're gonna need to keep talking about building permit data results um, at the 916 meeting. Uh, so incentives, PLA impact, um, employment permits, and we hope to still have a draft of the growth monitoring report that um, we won't send to you ahead of time. We will walk through it with you at the meeting. Um, we won't walk through the whole thing, but um, we're not going to have it ahead of the meeting, and um, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to go through it at the meeting. We're just going to talk about how it's structured, what we've done since you saw it the first time, that kind of thing. Um, you, we already answered the question about building permit data review outside of the meetings. Awesome. We'll make that um, spreadsheets available as we continue to have them. There'll be different spreadsheets for each set of charts. Um, and then we anticipate um, at minimum the October 7th and 21st meetings to review and discuss the report. Um, we'll go probably through sections um, once you yeah, I think that's how we're going to go through it. Um, and then maybe November 4th and November 18th. So I apologize. Um, I hope you're having a great summer. <laughs> and um, I guess I'm kind of glad that we didn't end up having to do those multiple meetings during the summer because I think I know at least for staff, we needed a break and we needed to step away from all of this data input and come back with fresh eyes. Um, it was super helpful. And so I hope you all were able to um, get a break as well. I appreciate your patience. <laughs> Thank you for the schedule. Um, looks like a busy fall, but we're all looking forward to it. We're just looking forward to fall, I think at this point. Um, does anyone have any closing questions? Otherwise, we can adjourn. Okay, good to see everybody. Thank you so much, staff. This is amazing. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.